Joining me, Jason Kelly, the author of uh, Financially Stupid People Are Everywhere. Don't uh, be one of them. Great title, Jason. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming in. Um, My pleasure. Uh, so uh, 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 it seems obvious, and some of the things in the book I'm given to understand are uh, uh, fairly obvious, but this is not just about sort of, this is not just a how-to book for individuals. It's also a, an effort to help people understand uh, what, uh, the crisis that the United States government and 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 banks are in, and how they got into that problem, and how they're not going to get out of it. Yeah, correct? yeah, that's exactly right. I've written about this subject and and money in general for for almost twenty years now, and not not just me. There have been dozens of authors that have written probably millions of words on this subject, and it became very clear in the subprime mortgage meltdown that the message is not getting through. I mean, honestly, Ben. Proper money management is not that tricky. The reason we're surrounded by these, these traps and ways that people can ruin their financial future is that society wants it that way. I mean, this. What are those traps? I looked at government, banks, and big business and, and how long they have worked together in order to get people into debt as soon as possible so they're on that treadmill that requires them to not only hand over most of their income as interest over time, but also work a job, like it or not and be unable to build up the capital they need in order to, to pursue what they really want to do. Yeah, but, I mean, th th to a certain extent, isn't this just, uh, isn't there some just normal, like, basic, old school, like, personal responsibility here? Sure, sure. Yeah, um, but I didn't, I didn't want to just write that book again. You know, it feels like we've known the rules of money for, what, dozens of years, if not thousands of years, you right. know? And, and just that message by itself doesn't seem motivating enough to people. I mean, you know, on the one hand, they're looking at the commercial of the brand new luxury, the car they want over here. And on the other hand, they're reading, you know, how to save for a rainy day over here and which way are they going to go. So what I wanted to be different about this book was to give them the motivation to know what they're up against and that it's a deliberate machine to try to take their wealth. It says that this is, uh, exposes the American economy for what it is. I love this uh, sentence. A vehicle to transfer money from financially stupid people to financially smart people. <laughs> uh, well, that would seem like it would sort of just add to the widening gap between the, the wealthy yeah. and the poor. Uh, what does that mean exactly? And, that means that... And like tangibly, like what does that mean on a as sort of a, 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 a human level Concrete you can yeah. grab onto. Yeah. It means financial form will never reform, will never work. I mean, everybody seems really hopeful now that, oh, good, we've been through the storm. We know what the problem was. We can get it fixed so that, that my friend Bob and, and his girlfriend Sally are not going to get in over their heads again. It's never going to change. Quick example, do you know automotive financing is not even included in this thing? Yeah, this book has only four points, Ben. It's the first rule of finance and then the three C's, I call them. Those three C's are credit cards, cars, and castles. Well, cars, automotive financing, is one of the big three. And it's not even in the financial reform bill. There's your quick tangible. What, what, what are they? Because I, I bought a car, and I'm sure, I, I'm sure I'm financially stupid. I bought a car <laughs> in December. Uh, how did I screw that up? It's presuming that I'm like most people. If I could make it perfect for you. I, I imagine you financed it. Oh, yeah. Okay, how many years did you finance? Do you remember? I don't know, 40? <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Well, you know, a lot of people think, don't know, actually. I think it, I, I, I'm, what I, it's funny. I was thinking about it yesterday. Uh, it might be five. It might be six. I'm not 100% sure. I mean, obviously, I had it in the right, car. Right. I, I think I financed I put no money down. Okay. Um, I, so I think it's six, okay. but I'm not sure. Well, I'm afraid. No, no, <laughs> I'm sure that's worse news. <laughs> A lot of people are, are borrowing five to seven years for their car. Yeah. And so let's just use you to, as an example. So you put do. yourself right out oh, there. Yeah, all right. um, you needed that car. I know, especially in, in L.A., Southern California, you've got to have a car. You're not going to take any other way of, to get around town. Yeah. But what I would like to see people do is, at least in the beginning, just try to get a three-year plan with a maybe late model used car. Not, not a jalopy. We're right. talking about something that will get you around town okay that's maybe not the gleaming car of your dreams, but it'll get you from A to B, get you to the studio and get you home. Right. Right. Once people do that and then they're, they're done with payments, that car after three years will be paid off and you probably got another five years out of it. Maybe not that long, but you've got more time on it. The, the thing I'd like to see people rediscover is the joy of anticipation. So there's no, there's no, I, I agree with you, and I, I'm a fairly uh, capable of being, and at times in my life, and current circumstances have rendered that due to my own negligence in part, but I'm pretty frugal most of the time. 
because it's L.A. and because I like driving and because you're in the car a lot, that was one of the, I didn't even splurge that much. I brought like a $31,000 car. It was new. It was a Ford Escape. It's not like I was loaded, but I didn't buy a $50,000 car. Yeah. You know, but I'm paying $500 a month with no money down essentially forever. Yes. You know, yes. you're right. But what I, one reason, one thing I thought about, and we'll move off the cars because I want to know about the other three C's, but the, like when you try to buy a late model used car, and this car was like 31 by the time I bought some protection because it has so many computers in it. Yeah. Um, like a late model used car is like 24 grand. And I was like, seems like, but you're saying that $7,000 matters partly. <laughs> well, too. probably I, I would have been more aggressive. If you're really going to just let me turn all the knobs and yeah, levers. Yeah, I'd say, you know what, that's, that's probably a fine car you've got. But I bet you could have gotten by on something in the lower range. Let's say get it below 15. Now we're talking a real difference. And, yeah. and, and you know, they're not all pieces under 15, by the way. But to, no, to of complete... Course, of, course, <laughs> of course I could have. You thought, it's crazy. I mean, it, I, I just didn't want to. I know. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. But here's, what, here's the big picture before right. we move off cars. Um, living in Japan is mm -hmm. where I am now. And one thing that's shown me is a cash-based culture and really the beauty of that. I think what we have been robbed of in America is the anticipation of buying. So you have your car now, and along with your car, you have, as you put it, a $500 a month payment forever. And that's not unusual here. Right. If we'd been able to reverse the process, so for five years you were socking that money away, which you're doing anyway, you're just, you just have the car in advance. For five years you'd be thinking, well, I'm going to get that new car in five years, I'm going to get that new car. And when you walked in that day with cash on the counter for it, you would have owned the car in its pristine, brand new state, obligation free. As it is now, at the end of the five or seven years, you have a five or seven year old car and you're finally paid off, you're probably ready to get a new one and there's that probably for life point you mentioned. So I'd like to help Americans rediscover this joy of anticipating the big purchase. Talking to Jason Kelly, author of uh, Financially Stupid People Are Everywhere, Don't Be One of Them, apparently too late for me. Um, <laughs> no, it is not. No, I it's definitely that. not too late, but I definitely <laughs> am uh, uh, foolish. I bought a house I, in the worst time. I bought a house in the summer of 06. I sold it in the spring of this year, 10. I mean, I, I bought high, I sold low. Okay. Um, it's good thinking. Um, but coming out of that, my thought was, getting sucked into the castle argument yeah. where I like, what's so great about owning a house when they cost this much money? Is there something terrible about renting? No, there isn't. And in right. fact, even point that out in the book, renting might not, might not be right for every reader. Um, for example, when we're... Mean buying might not be right for every reader. Uh, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what I meant. Renting may be a valid option yeah. for, for readers. For example, when I was in my 20s, I rented. What was wrong with that? I mean, at that time, I couldn't afford a home with a pool, for example, but by renting an apartment that included one, I had a, a private swimming pool available for whatever that monthly rent was. Yeah, I mean... And maintenance and stuff, you know, maybe you're not into that. You don't want to mow the lawn. You don't want to fix yeah, things. I really want to mow the lawn. <laughs> right? Come on. So, no, I don't think you're a diminished American if you rent, and I... People always Take say, like, you know, out. but you're wasting your money on renting, but I always think you're living somewhere. It's not wasted. You get right. to walk in the door, and you're sheltered from the rain. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel shower. like waste when wasting. you're not being sunburned during yeah. the day, right? Well, that's true. And, you know, really, the only time it makes sense, I think, to buy a home is when you're going to be somewhere a while. You're going to be able to, to eventually have the home be worth more than the sum of everything you paid for it, including all the interest. And in order to do that, you got to put down roots, stay in a place a while. And, you know, truthfully, Ben, I think we shouldn't view our homes as investments. I mean, these are not, you don't retire with a home in the sense that you're going to take off a piece of the house and go buy something. You, you choose a home because that's where you want to live. And, and it can make financial sense if you buy at a decent price and hold it long enough so it's eventually worth more than all the debt. That's about the only time most Americans should go into debt, That was never going to happen in my house, ever. I mean, the mortgage was, it was a joke. It was comical, and it was all interest. So yeah. I mean, it was just, yeah. you know, it was like we were renting with a big tax deduction. Yeah. But, but just to pick right up on yeah. that, therein lies the problem, is that always, I mean, here in L.A., you probably, of course, a reasonable person, you looked at that and you said, well, these are my options, either live somewhere I wouldn't even dream of living because it's so awful, or pay these outrageous sums that, that is where yeah. my neighborhoods start at. Well, my contention is if we stopped that, if we said, then buying is not an option, and people just said, instead of buying more, I'm going to not buy. If we did that across the board, cars, houses, things we get on credit cards, prices would come down. They're only overinflated because people keep paying them. So I think uh. you were smart to become a renter. 
Yeah, that's there what I'm talking about. There you go. Feel better. All right, we're running out of time, uh, but I got another question for you. Jason Kelly, author of Financially Stupid People Are Everywhere, Don't Be One of Them. Uh, so the whole, you mentioned Japan, cash culture. We're obviously not a cash culture. Right. Um, value for people to stop using the credit card or to, to min you know, you can't all the time, but reduce it significantly. Yeah. And just whatever, pay cash if you can for what you're buying. Right? Yeah. Or, for example, with a credit card, if you use it properly, you don't need more than one. You, you charge yeah, you, it that right. month and, and the next you pay month you it. pay it off, right? right? But to show so you, you... So use it, use the credit card for To your advantage. Right. Yeah, that's right. 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 Maybe, maybe you'll accrue points or something. But, yeah. but most of those incentive programs exist to trap people because they'll get a thousand on there and they can't quite make it so it turns to two and three. Right. The average family in America has 13 credit cards. Is that right? Yeah. So that right there is your proof that we don't know how to manage these things. I mean, and if they were properly managed, Ben, they wouldn't be profitable to the banks. 80% of the profit in that business is from mistakes people make, interest and late fees. The other 20% comes from merchant fees. So I contend. 80% is the Yes, most. 80%. Well, the interest, obviously, but the late fees, too. That are right. Just goof ups. When right. And let's call them both mistakes, right. really, because right. we shouldn't be carrying the balance that accrues the interest. So I contend that if we used credit cards properly, the industry would disappear because that 80% would go to zero. And I think people would say, you know what? I'm paying this every month anyway. Why bother with the whole billing hassle? I'll just pay cash and I'm done when I walk out the door. Right. Or it would significantly reduce it and change it because it wouldn't go from 80 to zero. What if right. it went from 80 to 30. 12? <laughs> yeah, or try it, 25. Yeah. Um, all right, so uh, less than a minute. What would your main, main piece of advice, yeah? Is this. This situation we face, this financial calamity, we have faced many times in the past. We had financial reform. Has it ever been this bad? Yes, it has. Right. We've had a great That's depression in the past. But look but at this. But you think that was, I mean, that obviously, I know we had a depression, but you think that was, the, the circumstances were as dire, recovery as difficult. I believe so. Okay. Yes, I believe so. And I want to point out, we had a significant financial reform in this country. Um, after the savings and loan crisis 20-some years ago, right? Mm -hmm. What did that do? Not a darn thing. And it's not going to do a darn thing this time. So I want to say to everybody, the situation is never going to get better. You're always going to be faced with as many traps as you're facing today. So you, the reader, have to get smarter. That's the only place available for change. The bought-off politicians are not going to fix it. The banks are not going to stop keeping it this way. The tables will remain tilted. So we, consumers, have to wisen up. And even if they change, in, even if these, if the bill is a little better, mm -hmm. they doesn't change enough to, no. to materially change. Things. No, I mean consider this: the main reason we had this enormous blow up is that in 1999, Larry Summers, Robert Rubin, working in the Clinton administration, managed to unravel parts of Glass-Steagall that had been on the books since 1933. Right, but those guys are gone now. They don't have. Anything. Oh, sure, <laughs> right. Yeah, Larry Summers is nowhere near the White right. House. Right? right. This is why it never changes. Right. And you right. guys know that. I'm on the right show. You guys are kindred spirits. Jason Kelly, financially stupid people are everywhere. Don't be one of them. Don't pay $514 for a car that you couldn't afford in the first place until <laughs> the next two Olympic Games from now. Uh, Jason, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in. Uh,